This is when you take the pickle and like clunk, clunk somebody on the forehead. <laughs> Don't be embarrassed. Don't it's be all good. We do it. We do it all the time. <laughs> it was hard. I, I wound up homeless. Wow. <laughs> what, a, what a story. Um. Got one foot in society and one foot out. Uh, are you married? We're going to go jump on that horse. Whoa. Hi there. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to do something different. I have a special guest who is here all the way from Las Vegas visiting me in Austria and he's making his way to the studio as we speak. That special guest goes by the name Oz de Soleil and I'm super excited to have him here with us today. We're going to be answering some of your uncomfortable questions. So yeah, he should be here anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, shouldn't take him that long. Made it, made it. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, great to have you. Yes, with thank us. you, thank you for inviting me. Just some things for, for comfort, right? That's some kaleidoscopes and cigars. Yeah, very colorful. Yes, nice. yes. Made by Mikio, a new kaleidoscope maker in Japan. So how's Traveling. Vienna treating you? Great, great. Um, traveling by horse, there's no better way. When you yeah. get a chance, we need to roll back to the days of riding a horse. Uber yes. horse, that should be a Uber thing. horse. Yeah. We got Uber Comfort, Uber <laughs> Black, yeah. Uber Caballo. <laughs> yes, that's what's next. Um, but yeah, but the thing is, I, I've had some good food here in Vienna, and I like the cozy streets. Um, it's very walkable. Mm -hmm. Las Vegas is not mm -hmm. so walkable, but... All of the articles that I read about cigar lounges in Vienna, I discovered that they're old, mm -hmm. that there's an indoor smoking ban in 2019 mm -hmm. that, that was enacted. So there's no indoor smoke. Lots of cigar shops. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad to be here. And let me tell you this, because we're here to answer uncomfortable questions, I want to share. When you invited me to come here, this was the first time when I've been invited somewhere where I could afford to do it. I've been invited and, you know, I, I was broke, you know, I was, you know, go to Amsterdam and putting stuff on credit cards. And this was the first time where I was able to decide if I want to do it or not. And money wasn't a limiting factor. So this is special. Mm -hmm. Well, it's special to us, too. Yeah. And we're going to get into that because I put up a form so that people could send in um, their questions. And a lot of you did. Thank you so much. And one common question was, how do you become a Microsoft MVP? Maybe you can expand on that. But before, maybe some people don't know what a Microsoft MVP is. If you can just tell us a little bit about that. There are so many ways of answering that. But why I like being an Excel MVP is because we get to work directly with the engineers that make Excel and we get to partner with them to make the best tool that it can be. And we get some inside NDA knowledge about things that are stalled, things that they would like to do. And it's, it's odd to listen to the public complain about something and then have to be quiet about 
I know why it's not happening. So that's what I like. Um, it's not much of a career booster. Mm-hmm. It's really a commitment to a community and helping Excel be the best tool it can be. And it's not about, yay, we like everything about Excel. No, we have some fights with the engineers. The big thing, yes, you have to show skill with Excel. But as MVPs, we're expected to be part of the community. And every year that we're evaluated, we are evaluated on how much community activities we've done. And some people are bitter about that aspect of it. They'll say, I'll never be an MVP. I've got the skill, but I don't do all kinds of free stuff. I don't see it as free stuff. I see it as me genuinely wanting to help people get the most from their data. Not so much the mastery of Excel because um, there are people out there that rely on what we do with Excel. And they just want things to go right. And so when I'm committed to the community, it's about empowering this force of people to help make data and Excel the best it can be. Yeah, it's true. And there are people who can't afford to have to buy courses. You know, that, that's why I like doing YouTube videos. And with YouTube, like you can do, you know, whatever topic you feel like sharing. Mm-hmm. It's not, it doesn't have to be in a special structure. You can make it entertaining. You're free. You can be creative with those videos. Mm-hmm. And yep. I think that's, that's what we enjoy yep. doing as well. That's, yes. The other question that's related is what personality is MVP life for? And what career paths do usually MVPs have? So let's start with the personality. So do you think MVP life is for a specific personality type? I want to draw from something that Ken Poole said that I identified with. Mm -hmm. And we haven't done any study on this. But he said a lot of us MVPs were in situations in real life where there was a lot of loose stuff, bad reports, things dropping into cracks. And we decided, okay, I guess I'm going to be the one to tighten this stuff up. And when he said that, yeah, Mm -hmm. that was my start was I would get, okay, Oz, every Monday you're going to get this report and you got to do this stuff with it. And then I would get calls from people saying, well, you, you messed up again. Well, I was just following these instructions. Oh, the instructions are old. The business rules have changed. The reports don't reflect the changes in the business rules. So, okay, stop sending me this report. I'm going to deal with a data dump and figure this out myself. And um, it calls for a whole lot of Excel skill that I didn't immediately have. Obviously, Ken Pulls has been through his version of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I have thought about Excel MVPs as these rogues that delve in going into stuff that we weren't supposed to or um, that's not our job. I heard that a lot. That's not your job. Well, I want this person who called me up and said, this is the third time I've called you about this stuff. I don't want there to be a fourth time. And we're very different from the maybe Windows MVPs or, uh, you know, database or Azure folks, because that's careers for them. We are among the fortunate few who can make a career out of just Excel, a tool. And so I feel like, yeah, there are a lot of us rogues versus people who wind up in database and and that is their world. That's interesting what Ken said, because when I think back myself, for me, it was like I needed to solve problems. I needed to get data over from another system. It was an old system to a new system. And Excel was the best translator. It's what I used as a mapping table 
basically with you know programming some VBA logic, but I had to figure it out. And I think it has to be the personality type. It has to be someone who is willing to figure things out, who doesn't just say it can't be done in Excel. Right. Excel is not for that. It's not a mapping table. It has to be someone who says, no, there is a possibility and I'm going to look and find it. So that self-drive, that has to be, that has to be there. Amen. Yes. Yes. And that, that's a deeper layer to what I, via Ken Pools, was saying. That's a deeper, you got to be the one that says, I can figure this out. And I developed a three-day process for one thing that I had to do. It started out, it was handed to me as, we're going to send you this report. And then based on the report, you send out these certificates and pens. And then the calls would come. Why did you send me this again? Why didn't you send me this one? And that's where I start to dig and probe. And one thing that I've encouraged all analysts, whether they use Excel or, or whatever they do, is they got to give a damn about the people who have to deal with the consequences. Mm -hmm. I would add giving a damn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it, it's not just about Excel trickery because mm -hmm. those people who are calling up complaining, they aren't sending the certificate back and saying, hey, you, uh, you just filtered and sorted and dragged mm -hmm. cells around. Um, um, no, we want you to do more fancy tricks. They don't care. Yeah. You mentioned before that you are lucky now to be in this situation that you can come visit me. So can you tell us a bit more about your background and how it started and how you ended up doing what you're doing now? Mm -hmm. You're doing LinkedIn learning courses, great YouTube channel, being a Microsoft MVP. Wow. There, there's so much there. Um, and some of it is uh, spending six years in the Navy, getting out of the military and not knowing how civilian life worked. And um, I went to college and still, you know, I wasn't really in civilian society until I was in my early 30s and stuff weird. So it was hard finding a job, even though I got my college degree and Eventually, I'm a veteran with a college degree, no experience with anything other than navigating a submarine, and uh, wound up in a customer service job. I hated that job. I, I really cared about the customers. I didn't like the unnecessary suffering behind our bad data, our obsolete reports. I stood up against my supervisor, my director, and solved a lot of problems and found out many years later that when a new director came in, one of his uh, directives was to fire me. But he saw that I was actually helping and trying to help. I was not there to be belligerent. I got a reputation for probing and digging. And that's what got me some uh, promotions. I got to see different parts of the company. And I didn't have that much Excel skill. It was more just this reputation of Oz will probe and dig. And when the numbers look funny, I will get up off my ass and probe and dig. Wow. Oh, those, <laughs> you're taking me back. And so, yeah, there again, eventually there was the layoff. And then I start freelancing. And I liked that. I liked being exposed to different problems. Because one thing I didn't like about having a regular job was once I fixed the process, I owned it. That's not how I work. And I've got ADHD, like formally diagnosed. I'm not using it like some casual, like forgetfulness or distraction, but true diagnosed ADHD. I need some level of chaos, Excel and dealing with messy data fed that chaos. Being in a regular job is too much routine. And so I liked having different projects. 
Today I'm working with an insurance agent and his part-time assistant. Over here, I'm working with a nonprofit. Over here, um, a marijuana dispensary in Washington State. A lot of the needs were similar. A lot were different. They all had different starting points. I worked with a company that made food containers. And so we're dealing with like, okay, a six by six Ziploc bag, a 12 by nine Ziploc bag, a five by five clamshell. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. I loved it. Um, and so fortunately, I've been able to build that up into a, a career, uh, the blog, the YouTube channel, and then LinkedIn called me. So when you started freelancing, did you start your YouTube channel already? Was it a thing that you thought, I'm going to do freelancing and I'm going to build a YouTube channel? Or did that come later? That came later. There was a layoff. I'm trying to figure out what to do. I thought about maybe getting a um, project management certification, a risk management certification or something. But Excel kept coming back to me. I figured I want to freelance, so I need a web presence. And so I started a blog posting about Excel functions, features, new features. And then people like Mr. Excel, Bill Jellin, I was on his radar. He knew who I was. I had made a couple of videos for friends. They needed help with something. And I might make some three minute video and set it to unpublished on YouTube and send a link to my friend. And after a few of those, I saw that. I like making video, but I've got this blog. I've been doing the blog a long time, but then after a while, the more I blogged, the more I found myself dealing with CSS and HTML, and that is not what I wanted to do. And maybe a four hour blog post, half of that was going on the forums, asking questions about HTML. But when I did video, I'm not dealing with the code behind the video editing software. I'm making video. So when it takes me 15 hours to edit a video, that's my choice, my creative decisions, and not me fighting with the software. Was it through your YouTube videos that you became an MVP? So do you think it was because of your YouTube videos that you became an MVP? No, partly. Um, it was my general presence um, in forums on LinkedIn, my blog, because I had been blogging a long time um, and the videos came later, but the blog and the forums, that counts as community activity. My channel was still pretty young and pretty small when I was nominated to be an MVP. Yeah, actually mine too, because I mean, I, I had started doing like weekly YouTube videos, but it was still small, but I was very active on Quora. So that mm -hmm. was like my main contribution was Quora. And, you know, when people ask me, like, how do I become an expert in Excel? I'm like, go and answer questions. You know, go to Quora, mm -hmm. go to uh, Microsoft community forums and answer questions. Because honestly, that's how I got better, was trying to come up with the, with the answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that as, and see, the MVP decision committee that's deep in the woods behind the black curtain, they don't tell us what the criteria are. Yeah. What's enough? And is, is our criteria weighted differently? We don't know. But I have a suspicion that they look for us to plant our flag somehow. And I cut through nonsense. I'm not the best at Excel. But my role in forums, I would go on a forum and somebody's asked a question and there's already several solutions by the time I get there. But I would do things like, hold on a second. Because of the way the person asked this question, all of this VBA code that you just posted might work, but that person is not going to be able to be responsible for it. They won't be able to tweak it or nothing. And here is my long, crazy formula that will work. Yeah, uh, lots of debates, lots of cutting through nonsense. 
I feel like that's been my role. And sometimes I will introduce myself here. I got to be the uncle again. Your parents are giving you VBA code, which I know you don't know anything to do with. But I'm the estranged uncle who's going to call up and say, ah, don't listen to them here. This, this is what you need to do, right? Yeah, I think I like that approach. You know, there are so many different ways to solve a problem in Excel. And sometimes some people feel very strongly about the way it should be solved. Mm -hmm. You know, some yeah. people say, no, 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 this is the best way. Right. Use this way. But, you know, I feel like the best way is the way that the person is actually going to use. Yes. You know, the way that they understand and they're right. comfortable with. Right. VBA might work, but it can break and then they have no idea what to do with it. Right. But a formula like that or a formula that needs maybe 10 hel helper columns. Helper columns. Might be a lot better for them. Yeah. Right. Because they can follow. They can understand what's happening. Yep. And um, also is the context. And we can say things like, don't hard code values, okay? And somebody may say, okay, here is this complicated formula that's future-proofed. If your data changes, if you add a column or remove a column, the formula will adjust. But my context and needs are, this is a one-time thing, and I'm gonna paste this into an email and send it off and delete the whole workbook. Yeah. Pretend it never happened. <laughs> yep, and go ahead and use hard-coded values. Go ahead and do things the nasty manual way if you have to. Uncle Oz is saying that's it's fine because of that context. Yeah, don't be embarrassed. Don't it's be all good. We do it. We do it all the time. Yes. <laughs> Next question is, what if this wouldn't have worked out for you? Do you have plan B for your life? And what was it? What if you couldn't live from like all of your Excel skills? Mm -hmm. What would you have done? Or did you have a plan B if this didn't work? Get some tattoos and drop out of society. Hmm. Just. Oh, you have some tattoos. Yeah, already, I do. Right? I do. <laughs> so I'm halfway. So. Right. <laughs> Got one foot in society and one foot out. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> what about. Making um, kaleidoscopes. 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 That's, <laughs> that's been a new thing. I don't think I'd want to make kaleidoscopes, but I do look at being some kind of a patron or a support of the kaleidoscope community. But for me, I don't know. Because, you know, going into uncomfortable territory, I had a therapist who kept telling me I need to get a job. And then he says, but I've accepted now, if you were going to be good at this, you would have been good a long time ago, but you're damned and determined to make it work. And it took a long time. I don't know what my plan B was. Uh, there were moments where I thought about getting a job. I'm sitting up here with $200 in the bank and I just paid my rent and now I've got a month to pull everything together, to then go through this again next month. That's hard and scary. But I never became somebody else's burden. I never had to call a friend, a family member, and say, yeah, I need $2,000. I think that might have been the point where I might have gone to get a job. But I don't know. To think of it, I've never been good with office politics. It's, I struggle with that in the Navy. There are the rules that are stated, and then there's what actually happens. And I constantly found myself in this gap, looking difficult, belligerent, and that's so uncomfortable. Yes, clients, um, they can talk about me amongst themselves, um, decide to end a project and not tell me why. But that's different from being at a job and you know, getting called into somebody's office and saying, uh, we're officially uh, like putting you on report or, or whatever. 
toward a firing or having HR show up at the desk and say, I'll come with us or just having somebody say, oh, you didn't know about that. You know, something weird that was going on in the office. I'm bad with that stuff. Yeah, office politics is something I couldn't deal with either. You know, it's you just feel like you want to do your job. You want to do something good yes. for the company. And then you have to deal with what does IT department allow in? You know, are you allowed to do this or not? And who has the right to make these changes? It just becomes, you know, it, it's yeah. just, it, you, know, you stop loving what you actually like to do yeah. and you start to have to deal with this stuff. Yeah. And I find it interesting what you said earlier that, you know, you had this manager who then realized your potential, that you were actually trying to do good. Yeah. And managers like that, they make a big difference. Yes, they do. You know, like the other one before might have thought like, you know, Oz is just annoying. He's always questioning this stuff. He's always doing this. They see it as annoying, whereas the other one mm -hmm. saw it as help. You know, Oz yep. is trying to help. Yep. And that really makes a difference. It does. It does. And, and you just reminded me of a, a retail job that I was fired from. Walked in one day, was given my two weeks notice. And a few years later, I ran across one of the managers and I asked him, what was that about? You ask too many questions. And the owner was cooking the books. There again was me trying to understand and be genuine and want to help. And I didn't know I was buttoned up against illegal activity. So how did that go? It was hard. I, I wound up homeless for several months, like literally, um, because the two weeks notice, my last day on the job was the same day that the um, lease on my apartment ended. And I had two roommates and they decided they wanted to live on their own. And I couldn't keep that apartment and afford it with no job. And suddenly I've got no job that um, a potential landlord can call and confirm. And so I put my stuff in, in a storage unit and just walked out into the streets. And uh, yeah. That must have been difficult. I mean, difficult oh, is underestimated. Right. Like it's right. It's I mean, finding out things like, yeah, there's the, the cold in Chicago. Mm -hmm. and the snow and the slush, but also things like, we need your address in order to cash this check. I got a P.O. box. No, nope, we need a street address. And then do I tell this person, look, I'm homeless. Give me a break. Now we're getting into my pride. And I don't want to give this person the honor of knowing my situation take the check back and go somewhere else and figure out how to cash it. But, you know. So how did you turn things around? My brother finally convinced me to move to California and stay with him for a while. And, and I'm really appreciative of that. And, and, and that was hard. But I had gotten to a point where, like, I was applying for jobs. And I eventually realized that even if somebody called me right now and said, hey, we want you to start Monday. I wasn't in a position to do that. I would show up in clothes that I'd been wearing for you know four or five days in his backpack and all my stuff in the storage unit. So I got to a place, hang myself. And I, I, I had a room in the YMCA. And I remember grabbing this sprinkler pipe and like and making sure that when it was time that it wouldn't just break down and and you know then I gotta figure out another way <laughs> and I didn't want to go to California I, I liked Chicago so it's either the sprinkler pipe or California went to California 15 months temp jobs, save money, and eventually 
get back to Chicago. And it was a slow grind coming up out of that hole. But I eventually did. Oh, I'm so happy. You're <laughs> <laughs> wow. How long was this before you became an MVP? You started your YouTube channel. How long? That was like 99. And uh, yeah, I got back to Chicago near the end of 99, wound up, you know, with this customer service job. And then things slowly, slowly, <laughs> slowly. Yeah. I, I was bitter, so bitter. There was a point where, um, yeah, I had some friends in the 90s and um, in Chicago and left to go to California to get everything together. And when I come back, we were glad to get together. But then after a while, they stopped returning my phone calls, stopped hanging out with me. And then one time I called one of my friends and she asked, accidentally picked up the phone. Um, you know, you've changed. You've gotten so bitter. And I felt like, ah, I know I'm bitter. I don't even like me right now, but nothing has turned out. I'm a veteran. I got my college degree. I haven't had kids out of wedlock. I don't have a drug problem. All this stuff about being a minority and all this stuff is supposed to help. Being a veteran is supposed to help. And nothing was going right. And I couldn't figure out why. Um, but then I started playing the bass. Being in a band, I felt like I mattered. Mm -hmm. They needed the bass. If I couldn't make a rehearsal or something, they had a problem. And so I mattered. I made it to rehearsals. And that turned my bitterness around. Wow. <laughs> what, a, what a story. Um, yeah. well, I'm really happy that you're sharing this with us because, I mean, I know a lot of people go through difficult times and it really helps when you can just listen to someone else's story and see how they turned it around for yeah. themselves. Yeah. So yeah. I, I hope the story can yeah. re resonate with you guys. One question before we change the tone and <laughs> right, go back yeah, up. Let, let, let's stick to one, <laughs> one question is, how many times are you confronted with discrimination in regards to gender, diversity, ethnicity, and how do you handle it? And this question was directed for mm -hmm, both of, right, to right. both of us. So You want to take that one first? Especially on YouTube, you know, I do get a lot of like hate comments or you know, under the videos, things like, you know, you should be showing us how to make a sandwich, not showing us how to use our Excel or how to use a computer. I, I don't, I mean, this is just a personal thing. How I handle it is I just take it as a joke. Like, I think like these people are just, you know, they come out of their holes to, to just vent, right? And they, this is their channel. This is the way they may be calmed down and everyone deals with their own problems and you know they just found me as a target to get rid mm -hmm. of their aggressions i don't take it personally i even i do something really weird i take a screenshot of these and i add it to my one note and i sometimes go through them just for fun you know just to see like the diversity of people that mm -hmm. are out there like how did they even come up with saying something like this because i could never <laughs> think of saying something like that and i find it fascinating mm -hmm. what things that people come up with it's just fascinating you know there are days sometimes that i wonder like what am i doing with my life like is this my purpose obviously on such a day if i see such a comment i would probably you know it, it might make me feel worse but I also collect comments from people who do say really nice thing and I, things, and I do have a one note for that. So I go there. For me, I just, I mean, each person is different and they are doing this for a reason and they probably are not at a good place mm -hmm. in their life right now. Um, so I don't take it personally. That's the way I deal with it. But I know it, it is, 
you know, depending on the type of comments that you get, some can hurt differently. So something like that might be easier for me, like to let go of, but some comments might be like, you're not competent enough, you know, or depending on what they're, you know, putting, touching on. It's if I feel a bit insecure about that and then they mention it, it can hurt more. But I think it's just realizing like, okay, no, I'm insecure about that. But I mean, I don't care Mm -hmm. if I'm not, I'm sharing what I know and someone might benefit. So I think it's just like trying to understand your feelings and why something makes you feel like that instead of just reading this and being mad. But like, why am I mad about this? And yeah, it, it takes it takes practice, but YouTube gives you great practice yes. every day with the comments. Yes, yes, <laughs> gives you lots of practice. Yes, and that's one thing I like about YouTube is that there's always the next video, always next week, and you grow. and And, and I like that you say you you keep a list of positive comments as inspiration and reminding you who you are for people. Um, I have comments taped to the cabinet in my kitchen at home as, you know, very compelling webinar, whatever, um, to remind me, you know, when those negative comments come in. But discrimination, uh, negative comments. Now, see, I struggle with a lot of um, discrimination stuff. I am reluctant to you know, throw the uh, racism penalty flag. Cause I don't know what's going on with somebody when they say something. I'm living a great life and I'm grateful for that. And I stay there. It means a lot to me for somebody, somebody who's black will email me, message me and say that it means a lot to see one of us. And yes, I love that. And at a deeper level, I grew up in the 70s and 80s and a lot of black exploitation films, a lot of funk, disco, R&B. And when I look for videos, look for music to go with my videos, that's where I'm pulling from a lot, Uh, where it would be safer to find something jangly, you know, something soft, the corporate YouTube has allowed me to give myself permission to develop a genuine voice from where I'm from. I really love the community that's grown up around me and embraced me and shown me that I don't have to be uh, anodyne and corporate in order to be effective and accepted. I can say things like, let me whoop this on you today, folks. And that's coming straight out of a Dolomite movie where Dolomite was talking to Creeper. And he said, you ain't got to worry about your next fix, man. You whoop some information on me, I'll whoop some bread on you. And he got on this big old furry hat cocked to the side and his bell-bottom pants and his cane and he's walking all cool, with long Cadillac. Yeah, I like that. You whoop some attention on me, I whoop some Excel on you. <laughs> and then we'll get in a long Cadillac. You know, yeah, see? Yeah, no corporate. No corporate. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. How do you cope with the highs and lows of business and keep going? I come up with these like personas or analogies and I just think about how if I, if my profession was riding bulls, there are times that shoot will open and the bull will go and I'm not ready and poof, I just, I'm on the ground and the rodeo clowns, they'll come and shoot a bull away or I might get stepped on and break my pelvis. That's part of it. I think we're getting into personality, more personality stuff. Mm. Um, I've had friends who uh, make way more money than I do. Uh, They have specialized skill and they have said they could not do what I do. They 
like getting a paycheck, not having to chase down customers, deal with people who don't pay, uh, managing scope creep. I think of it as, yeah, which bull am I riding today? Oh, I'm riding uh, red cushion today. Oh, red cushion does a lot of spinning to the right. So do you wake up like and say like, oh, today I don't feel like doing anything? Mm-hmm. Yes. Do you have those? Yes. And then you don't do anything. Or do you force yourself to still do something, even if you don't feel like it? Well, that depends. Because there was one Friday I got up and didn't feel like doing anything. I got in the car and went on a five-day road trip down the Oregon coast, refresh myself and come back. And then there are other days where I have to remind myself that there might be some deadlines coming uh, somebody's expecting something from me. Remind myself that I am living a great life and I need to respect that. Show the gratitude by getting up and doing what I need to do. I have days like that too. Like, Well, actually, I had like a year like that where I had to down. Mm. And it's not the business, but psychologically, you know, in the in myself because mm-hmm. i was like you know is anyone anyhow watching these videos i mean if i make another version of the if function does it bring any value to anyone if i have another course is it valuable so i was going through this this period as well and then i just had to remind myself first of all like i mean it's amazing i could never imagine to be at a place like this where you know mm-hmm. where you're here mm-hmm. I think what happened to me, like why that phase came about was, you know, we were creating courses, a few courses the year before. And I just felt like I was in this hamster wheel of, you know, content after content, like one thing after the next and working like long, long, long hours. And I felt like You know, when you have this, when you go to a restaurant and you order this amazing meal and then you just gulp it down in like two seconds, Mm -hmm. you don't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You just gulp it down. And I felt like that's what I was doing to my work. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to enjoy the process. I wanted to sit and give my full attention to each video. I wanted, but I felt like I was just gulping that, like I was just knocking these out and I wasn't enjoying the process. Right. So that's when I realized, no, I have to step back. I have to take some time off. So we went off to Spain for a month. And after that, I thought, no, I'm going to do everything but at my own pace. I just want to enjoy, enjoy the process. And the moment I catch myself not enjoying the process, it means stop now. Yes. Stop now. Go back and see, yeah. see what's missing. And yeah. Just take it easy. Yeah. Yeah. You remind me of a conversation. I think there was Snoop Dogg. And John Stewart and some other people having a conversation and they were saying that when is it time to quit? And they said that when you start cheating the process, it's time to be done. And that's what John Stewart offered when he quit the Daily Show. It had gotten to a place to where do I have to put a suit on again? Do we really have Mm -hmm. to go to a location? Can I shoot this from home? That's cheating the process. Um, and then there's not liking the process and, and readjusting. And I'm wondering, what did you do? What, what was life like before when you were on the hamster wheel? And what changed so that you could get back in it? Well, we tried to do more under a short time. So this is when I ended up on the hamster wheel. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, like, I felt like I have to do a YouTube video a week. I, I just felt like I cannot not do this because the audience is going to be disappointed. The YouTube algorithm is going to be disappointed. Mm, yeah. I'm going to disappoint myself because I've been doing this for so long and it means I'm slacking if I don't do a video a week. But that was just too much, doing a video a week, doing courses. And then our team is, it was, was growing. You know, we have to follow up on, on the other person's tasks and marketing everything Mm -hmm. i I felt like i'm doing so much more doing a lot more but having less output that's what i felt and i have to do more and more and more yeah so that's when it felt like it was too much and the time off 
So the one month off, we, we were planning to go to Spain for a month off, but I took my video equipment because I thought, okay, two weeks is enough for me. After two weeks, I'm going to start filming. I just didn't feel like doing anything. I didn't feel like filming at all. So I said, I'm not going to do it. And let's see what happens like on YouTube and stuff. Let's see what happens. And nothing happened. Yeah, nothing happened. Everything, everything <laughs> went on. Every uh -huh. life goes on. Uh -huh. The only thing that happened is I felt better. Yeah. You know, I felt better inside. I felt more grounded. Um, I started doing more meditation. Yeah, I, and that really helped. And then when we came back, I thought, okay, I, I'm not, like from this year, you guys on YouTube might have noticed that, you know, we haven't put out videos once a week lately. Um, it's been more like once a month. So I just decided, you know, we're going to take it easy and just put out a video when I feel like, you know, there is something valuable for me to share and then concentrate on courses, but do it at a pace where we all enjoy it. You know, not just me, but the rest of the team. They also felt pressure, right, Camille? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> our editor. Editing video after video was, it was just becoming too much for everyone. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. I had a coach when I was running a nonprofit. And one time I talked with her as I'm done with this, done, done, done. And we talked and she concluded I was on the verge of burnout, mm -hmm. that I was not ready to give up the nonprofit. And she said, when you get off the phone, you tell the board that you are taking two weeks off and don't bother you about anything. And as much as you want to try to help or answer a question, hold fast to being gone for two weeks. And that's what I needed. And it sounds similar to what yeah. you dealt with. All right. And then getting a sense of what you can do, what you can deliver on. Um, do you try to push something out because of the algorithm? And that's part of why my videos look like they do, is that I feel like I need to have fun. I did the straight in and out videos for a while and I felt like a hamster wheel. And yes, I could do two, three of those in a day. I didn't like watching them back. I felt like when I thought about my days as an analyst, there's more. Yes, I can show you some ifs, but when is it good? How do we compare it against other things? Um, what are we trying to accomplish here? I love those kinds of videos. And I felt like that context was needed and not just Excel plumbing. That has kept me moving forward. Next question. Okay. Are you married? No, I'm just not made for that. I like okay. getting in the car and just going. And when I decided to leave Portland and move to Oregon, I called the truck up and moved. I, I, that's really important to me. I don't want to seem like um, a wife would be a burden, but uh, I just don't feel made for that. It's, it's kind of spooky to me. <laughs> I understand. Okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, I am married. Right. You married. Right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, because there was a question under our picture saying, are you married? I didn't know if they meant like if we oh, are married oh. or you are married. But now I guess that answers every version of this question. Yes. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> oh. Okay. Do you get recognized? Yes. Not frequently, but. I walked into a bar in Las Vegas one time. The bartender recognized me. I was leaving a diner in Sacramento, California. Guy recognized me. Um, I was in a cigar shop in Tucson, Arizona, a cigar shop in Santa Barbara. You're the guy from TV yesterday. It was the ESPN. That was episode. from the ESPN. And the guy in Sacramento, that was from ESPN. And then uh, the guy in Tucson, that was from my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And so I get it. I was walking downtown Evanston, Illinois once. You're the guy that makes the YouTube videos about mm -hmm. Excel. We stopped and chatted a bit. And he said that my content helped him get through the lockdown. That meant a lot. So, yeah, I, I get recognized. Yeah, very cool. Will you talk about your experience as a dirty data assassin? This question was from Catherine. 
Catherine Mondragon in Canada. There is still top secret things around that. And I can only confirm that, yes, I was a dirty data assassin for a while. So do you still operate? Oh, we don't know. We'll be, we'll be watching. We'll keep an eye on you. See what you can you try. Ah. You can try. What's the most evil Excel function? Ifs. And I've done a video on this a while ago when ifs came out. And I get the idea about ifs, but a person has to remember the final component has to be what if none of the criteria are met. That just, no, no. And, and see, that's different from X lookup and that if not found piece. That's clear. But with ifs, there is not that piece that says, if not found. You just got to remember that. No. You can end up in some deep hole mm -hmm. with the ifs. That's right. Yeah, it's true. And now you're down there screaming for somebody to come throw you a rope. And I say, look, you never should have been using ifs in the first place. <laughs> Stay in that hole and think about how you oh, got down here. Oh, so you're so strict. But with scary. stuff like that, <laughs> I'm a very kind fellow other than that. Okay. Okay, guys, no ifs. No. Don't send a file to Oz that has an ifs. Change it to multiple if statements. You okay with that? Helper columns? Look up arrays. Look, look up ranges. Um, whatever. It's, whatever. Just don't put ifs. Right. Do you have an evil... Excel functional I feature? No, I, I mean, there are some that I don't like to use. Okay. I don't know if I would call them evil. You know, like, did you see Ian Bennett's presentation on evil functions for financial modeling? Mm -hmm. He had like this list of never to use functions, and that was like offset, indirect, circular references. Okay. But I mean, the context is in financial modeling, right. never to use. And then he had pivot tables and the medium list because they expand and change shape and data could go somewhere else. And I think the context is important, you know, like There's you, right? Yes. Context is everything. So, yeah, I can understand in financial modeling why it's probably better not to use these. Um, although it was so funny that he was himself in the file that he was presenting he showed indirect for validation, I think it was. And then he said, yeah, yeah, here it's okay to use because it's not a part of the financial model. It's outside the model and use indirect. So I think it's just, it's the context. It's what, it always. yeah, what, what is best for that? So like, you know, originally, like when I was, um, during my time, like when I was learning Excel and then I wanted to find data like that was greater than this or between this, I would use multiple if statements mm -hmm. until I realized, oh, VLOOKUP can do this or yeah. the lookup function can yes. do this, yes. right? Yes. So in that context, yeah, my multiple if statements would have been evil, right? It's not the right purpose, mm -hmm. but I didn't know any better at right. the time. So right. it was okay until I figured it out. Right, exactly. And, and there was one 25 level nested if statement that I used and it worked. Okay, next question from Shandu. How do you give your data a red mohawk? You have a good barber. Yes. You don't do that yourself <laughs> unless you want it all janky looking. Actually, I tried that in Excel. So this is the version that I came up with. We have a video question. Mm -hmm. That was sent through by Shandeep. Yes. So I have it Shandeep. right here. Thanks uh, for the opportunity for me to ask the question. So here's the question. If Oz were to suggest one or two improvements in Microsoft Excel, especially for the people who work a lot with messy data, what would those features look like? Beautiful. Okay. So what features in Excel? The thing that immediately comes to mind, a way to isolate or separate bold font, italicized font, underlies font. We can have 
mixed in one cell. This is something that people have been wanting. And right now, the only way to do that is with VBA code or to not do it or to do something, a, a solution that involves word. If there was something that can say, because in Power Query, we have uh, separate digit to non-digit. But if there was separate bold to non-bold, that would be beautiful. True. I also want one for summing values based on cell color without using VBA. Yes. That would be really cool. Yes. 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 Beautiful. Because um, there is a way of dealing with that through, I think, find, replace. But if it was just a straightforward way of doing that, yes. Yeah. Bring it to me and keep that ifs. No ifs. No. Yeah. That's like, ifs is like when I ordered a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and if people say, all right, number 18, and I go and there's a pickle next to the to, with peanut butter and jelly sandwich. No, oh, this is when you take the pickle and like, clunk, clunk somebody on the forehead <laughs> and say, you know, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I can picture you doing that. Yeah, it, it won't hurt them. <laughs> no. It's just like some pickle juice on their forehead and a little like they, they're going to be a little lower in, in their, their pride. Stay away from your ifs, okay? Stay away from your ifs. How did you get into the kaleidoscope scene? Or is there a scene? There is a yes, scene. Yes, there in, is. Yeah. There is. Uh, there's a kaleidoscope weekend that happens in Jerome, Arizona every October and the kaleidoscope expo that happens every June. And this year is going to be in Scottsdale, Arizona, but it started when I went on a road trip in 2022. I had no plan. Uh, people would suggest things to me. And one suggestion repeatedly was if you go through Arizona, you got to go to Jerome, Arizona, and you got to go to the kaleidoscope store. Well, I, I'm thinking cardboard toys, but a kaleidoscope store. OK, I got there and spent maybe two hours. And I saw they've got kaleidoscopes from maybe seven dollars up to twenty six thousand. I never mm -hmm. imagined. I didn't know that this was inside of me hibernating, waiting for the water to be sprinkled on it to sprout. I knew I wanted one. But then there's the question of would I actually look at it? So I decided I'm going to spend $185 on a wood body kaleidoscope by Ben Birdsill. You know, and the staff there, they teach you. They say, yeah, Ben turned the wood. He put the mirroring system inside. He mm. lamp worked the glass in this chamber. He put the oil in everything. And, and I fell in love with that, that craftsmanship and all the skills that it takes to build a kaleidoscope. And so $185 for what two hours ago I thought was a toy and then when I finally did get home to Portland, I would find myself muting the TV and just looking at the kaleidoscope. The way that the pieces move and you change the direction and the light comes in from different ways and things change even that way. This is so beautiful and calming and mm -hmm. to, again, the craftsmanship that it takes. So then I started thinking about the ones that I didn't get. Mm -hmm. And so I went back a few months later and bought more. And then a few months, a few weeks later, I bought more. But so how, how many do you have? At, oh, at 115, I stopped counting. And there's even two on the way from Japan. Yeah, I'd love to see your collection. All right. I'm yeah. to Las Vegas. Yeah. Yes. We need to go to Vegas, guys. Yes, Las <laughs> Vegas. All right. Las Vegas. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining me here. Yes. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. And thank you for inviting me. I hope you answered most of your questions. Yes. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's not the usual, but I hope we had a lot of 
good insights to share. Insights, a conversation. It yeah. went, went into some directions that I certainly didn't expect. My cutter, I got oh, a nice wow. that, Arturo that Fuente. Dangerous. Cuban Corona Maduro. No. Okay, so once you're done, then how about I join you on your horse and we check out Vienna a bit? Mm hmm. You go with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Vienna on horse. Yeah. Vienna on a horse. That's right. We don't want to keep your horse waiting too long. No, because it yeah. will come up here. Yeah. <laughs> mm hmm. <laughs> Well, thank you for being here, Oz. Yeah, thank you. Our pleasure. Yes, yes. And, to and thanks you. to the audience. Thanks for the people who sent in questions. I really appreciate this. We went into some territory that I was not expecting. I'm, I'm glad to share. And be a full person. That's, that's important. Thank you so much, guys. We're going to go jump on that horse. Well, not on the horse, but in the carriage. <laughs> We're right. going to take that's a look right. at Vienna. Yeah, no.